start off by again just saying thank you all for for participating and, and coming and joining our meeting today. I hope everybody is safe after the series of storms we've had over the last week. And as we continue to see some of this weather come through, I uh, hope we all have the opportunity to stay safe through this. Um, we do have a couple of opportunities uh, just today, or not just today, but today I have the opportunity to introduce uh, two new members of the community. I'd like to go ahead and give both uh, Nikki Gronley and Steve Dick an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, Nikki Gronley is our new director for the rural development. Uh, Nikki, would you like to jump on and introduce yourself? Hello there. Uh, I'm coming to you all from lovely Oklahoma and Cedar Shores, where uh, rural development is having a two day state meeting to work on goals and strategy. But um, I come from the broadband industry and was familiar with rural development and the work they do from that side of things. And um, I'm excited to join this group and also get to know your group better. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nikki. Really happy to have you on board. Uh, Steve, would you like to take an opportunity? Sure. Thank you, Tony. Uh, hi, my name is Steve Dick. I'm the, the new SED for the Farm Service Agency. Uh, I come to this organization uh, the last 17 years working for a farm coalition called Ag United for South Dakota, uh, but uh, also come to it for, as a producer aspect from a Cook County. Um, so um, certainly... Uh, a lot of I also was in Oklahoma last week, so uh, we got the room already there for you, Nikki. Uh, Sadasco, the employees organization, had their convention there last week, so certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to introduce myself, and certainly uh, appreciate the work that NRCS does in the in the state technical committee. So I know later on you're going to hear from Owen Fagerhag, our NRCS, uh, our our CRP expert, uh, for, who work, deals a lot with your staff. So thank you, Tony. Perfect. Thank you so much, Steve. So really excited just to have a, a full team uh, with with USDA here in South Dakota. Really, really awesome opportunity. So I'm just glad we, I'm glad we're we're fully staffed. Uh, we also have one of the opportunities to actually be face to face, at least here with the NRCS staff. And while we we are holding a virtual event this time, our next meeting that we're going to be holding is going to be a hybrid. Where we'll have everybody. We'll have uh, different locations that will be we get that will be gathering. Uh, but we still will have remote uh, or virtual options available because we do appreciate everybody who's been calling in. I know that travel and distance can be a challenge for some folks. Yeah. So again, again thank you very much. And we also we, I know no, I, that's, a second here. Let's see if I can. Your mom. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of our our uh, representative or representatives of our representatives here. So, Ryan, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. I'm Ryan Donnelly with Senator Thune's office uh, in the D.C. office working on ag and conservation policy. Um, to start, you know, really sorry to hear about the all the damage throughout the state last week and our offices um, willing and able to help as we can uh, as you're running into issues that um, through USDA where we can help, um, we are happy to do so. Um, and then, you know, we're also continuing to work on the farm bill, uh, trying to get ahead with some uh, round tables in the state uh, focused on various titles of the farm bill and working on getting some marker bills out there. So at the end of March, Senator Thune introduced a CRP bill to try to fix some implementation issues with the 2018 farm bill and to make grazing more uh, readily available uh, for CRP contract holders. And then just last week, he joined Senator Klobuchar from Minnesota in introducing the Ag Innovation Act. And I will shoot you guys some more information on that here shortly, but um, the idea is to have USDA do a better job of collecting conservation data across the various agencies and storing it in a secure data center um, so that researchers, we think of South Dakota State and other trusted uh, research partners of the department can utilize that data in a in a manner that maintains producer confidentiality to uh, determine which CR, which conservation practices are having the most benefit. So if producers are aware of, you know, the effects of cover crops, uh, no-till, other 
other conservation practices um, and you know the impact they have on improving soil health and ultimately reducing their risk and improving their profitability, uh, especially right now as we think about the uh, concerns of food shortages, um, it'd be helpful to know what what practices have the most benefit. So we've got um, a lot of support on that bill from the conservation community, and we'll welcome any any input you have on either the CRP or the Ag Innovation Effort. And looking forward to working with you all on on the farm bill. Uh, feel free to send send ideas my way. Um, we'll be interested to to get feedback from you all. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for for being so supportive of agriculture across the state. Really do appreciate that, and and also just uh, uh, for, for being so open with the information. So this this process that we're doing today, uh, while we have a lot of information, we're going to be sharing throughout our our uh, meeting today. The locally led process is a critical part of what uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service does. We we need to hear from our partners and from our from our uh, producers across the state. And again, while we're pre while we're presenting a lot of information today, we also want feedback. This is a process that we're we want to hear what you have to say. We want to take those take that feedback, and if we have the opportunity to incorporate that into our processes here, this is what one of our big goals are. So please, as we're going through our presentation, if you have comments or feedback, we're 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 listening. We're listening. And we want to hear what you have to say. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and just continue to move down the agenda. Uh, next on the agenda, we have a farm service agency update, uh, including conservation reserve program with Owen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tony. Uh, just a few things wanted to touch on. Um, so I guess first off, we've got a few things in the works on the conservation side. Uh, we concluded the general CRP sign up. We had 20,909 acres offered and there were 14,063 acres accepted. So about a 41, 42% success rate on our general CRP signups. Our grassland sign up 204 just concluded on the 13th. Uh, we do have some residual work to do here through the end of this week. Uh, but nation, uh, statewide, we had 566,000 acres applied on, offered under the grassland CRP, uh, yet to be ranked. So we don't know what our successes on that will be. Uh, but I'm, I'm not 100% positive, but at one time we were leading the nation on offered acres under the grassland CRP signup. So a lot of interest in that uh, conservation still very prominent within South Dakota. Uh, we do have, in addition, some ex some additional programs coming at us. Uh, Mark Norton with Game Fish and Parks may speak to this later on in the discussion or maybe wants to weigh in on it now. Uh, but we do have a CREP initiative in the Sioux River watershed area that's been proposed. Uh, that process is in a comment period on the NEPA analysis. And in the affected counties, any producers that would like to comment on impacts to that, uh, there's information available at the county level where they can go in and, and be part of that comment period. Uh, but that CREP initiative is being lifted and uh, will, in, in essence, mirror the Jim River watershed or James River watershed CREP that we currently have. Uh, so more, more opportunities for participants in that front. Um, I'm going to segue into the emergency conservation program and then come back to one CRP item that I, the state tech committee does need to to make some action on. Uh, but just an update. Uh, currently, we've got seven counties, uh, mostly west of the river, the Missouri River corridor uh, that are currently implementing emergency conservation program for drought. Uh, recently, you know, things have improved. We've been seeing some rains throughout the state, but we do have some impacted counties uh, utilizing the ECP program for drought. And then most recently, as of last Thursday, uh, the derecho that went through the eastern part of the state. Uh, it's been determined and applied on. We're waiting for concurrence. But basically, we did every county 
From the 281, 281 highway corridor and east, it affected 32 counties. Uh, and we've asked for a blanket approval to implement debris removal, uh, conservation structure, restoration, shelter belt, field windbreak restoration, um, and potential fence restoration or, or replacement. Um, so very impactful that storm that went through. Um, the debris removal, uh, just in kind of summary, is going to help uh, remove debris that was deposited on farmland to make it possible to be farmed again. And in some instances can help with cleanup on the actual farmstead if the debris is is directly impacting the farming operation. So an example that I give would be the, the machine shed or the pole barn collapsed on the planting equipment to remove that plant that debris so that that planter can be freed up and utilized in the farming operation. Not going to be wholesale where we're going to be able to touch every aspect of that farmstead, but would help with some of that cleanup. So lastly, um, we have a, a notice that was issued back in late April, which announced the request for new or modified safe acres for wildlife enhancement proposals, what we call safe. And we have two safe project areas in the state. One is the pheasant safe, which is mostly East River. And then we have a West River safe initiative, which focuses on the sage grouse and some upland nesting birds west of the river. The notice requires that all safe proposals be revisited to conform with a new format. And I did share the notice with Kathy Irving, and I have expectations that that will be sent out to the entire state technical committee. Uh, but it basically gives an outline framework of how our safe proposal has to conform. We don't expect to change any of the inner workings of our current safe proposal. It's just more of a uh, to conform to the new parameters. Uh, Mark Norton with Game Fish and Parks is going to be helping massage our current proposal to meet those standards. And I guess what I'm in front of the State Tech Committee today asking is that we have authority to convene the CRP subcommittee to meet the June 24th deadline uh, of this submission of this new reorganizing of our current proposal. I don't know how. Tony or Jessica, you want to proceed with that if it's just. Uh, it's been talked about and that's how we're going to proceed or if there needs to be a vote or. Um, I guess I'll open it up for any discussion or comments on what I've talked about and maybe some direction on where to go with this safe proposal. How what was the last time? I don't know if we've had a CRP subcommittee meeting since I became the SRC Owen. Um, you know, a truce, you know, I know there's numerous players. We've had some uh, with our state priority area boundaries. We convened uh, NRCS, Game Fish and Parks, Pheasants Forever. I think DANR was a part of that with the water quality piece. So I've had kind of some conservation groups come together with input, and then that's been kind of utilized for the subcommittee. Uh, but I don't, I'm kind of with you, Jessica. I'm not sure that I have a. I can pull this list and say this is our subcommittee group. So again, you know, once we get this finalized between Mark and myself, it would be getting it in front of that group uh, for concurrence with our, also our state FSA committee has to weigh in on it. So we've got some chores ahead of us prior to the 24th of June. Sure, so would it be best for this group um, if they wanted to be a member of that CRP subcommittee to just email Kathy Irving? That would, would that be, be acceptable? I believe okay. that would be acceptable and then we can do uh, an email poll once we get it finalized prior to submission. Sounds great, Owen. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions for myself before I turn my camera mic off? Oh, and this is Brandon. I just got a on that ECP for debris removal or removal of like buildings on top of equipment. Is yes. that something that and I, I think we'll probably end up getting this question. You know, some of that work's already happened. You know, people are so cleaning we, stuff up already. Is right. that can they go back? We need to, we need to be made aware. Um, and I'm waiting on some national office guidance, but we're also 
exploring trying to secure a programmatic 850 for our environmental compliance. And I'm hopeful that if that's received, that we can do this after the fact approval. But we are waiting for the final say so on that. But we realize that, you know, this happened last Thursday and we're at Wednesday. And folks, it's prime planting season, so a lot of this stuff was already being taken place. Uh, but we're going to help where we can within the program provisions and, and hopefully help. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Thank you much, Owen. I really appreciate your, your update. Uh, next on the agenda, we have Kent Vlieger. Uh, with a soil health update. OK, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yep, we can hear you. Yep, I'm going to share my screen. OK, is that presentation coming through OK? It is, yes. OK, good. OK, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Kent Bleager, State Soil Health Specialist uh, with the NRCS here in South Dakota. And uh, this morning we're going to wrap up our no-till doesn't work and neither do cover crop series. So um, if you've been uh, attending these meetings on a regular basis over the past year and a half or so, you know we've um, been doing this series. And, um, you know, I really have the, the title here just to, to catch people's attention. And it goes back to my field office days of uh, working with producers, um, you know, and they would often say, well, no till doesn't work. I tried that for a few years and it doesn't work. Or I tried cover crops last year and those don't work. And so I, I'm really just trying to get people's attention. Um, it's not that I don't believe those things don't work, but um, I do believe they work if they're implemented following these principles. And so the series is really about soil health principles, and then we go into a little bit of depth on each principle at, at, um, with each series. And today we're going to talk about livestock integration. Uh, this is one that uh, is one of my favorite principles to to discuss. Um, I think it's one that um, we sometimes have um, troubles with uh, producers adopting, or they're not interested in it, or they are interested, but they don't know how to get started. And so today we're going to cover uh, livestock integration as our fifth principle in the series. And uh, just as a reminder, I don't place any importance on um, a priority on any one of these. They're all just as important as the next, uh, but this is the fifth one we'll cover today. OK, so integrating livestock. And I throw this slide in there because these are my girls and they make me happy. So um, we're just going to get a start off with this. Hey, Ken. Why do we need to integrate livestock? Still... Hey, Kent. Yep. We're seeing. We're not seeing your your. We're seeing your just your first slide. Oh, it's Maybe not. Maybe need to switch screen. Okay. Right. One second. One second. Okay. Is that coming through yet? We're still just seeing your first slide. Okay, let's try this. How about that? Is that coming through yet? It looks like we're seeing your your desktop. Okay. Shoot. Um, yeah, maybe if you guys want to skip to maybe next in the series so I can get this fixed and not be able to adjust in general quick. Yeah, we can call out. Are you ready to go next? Sure. Yes. Good morning. So, um, okay. How is everyone today? Good, I hope so. All right, so the principle. Oh, hey, Colette, just a second here. Can, can you stop yep. sharing your screen? Yep, I'm trying to, I got all sorts of stuff going on here. I'm trying to get it stopped here. All 
All right. Well, he's working on that. Go ahead, Colette. Thank you. And sorry for interrupting you. No problem. No problem. So, OK, so I'm going to speak with you a little bit about the Conservation Innovation Grants. Um, the NRCS South Dakota did not have a CIG um, opportunity this year. The, because of our budget and a few other reasons um, last winter, we opted to not have that um, uh, announcement this year. However, now is a great time to uh, be thinking about next year. So the Conservation Innovation Grants are an opportunity to, um, to evaluate uh, innovative ideas for how they might work with um, with our with our field office, the, the existing suite of practices that are in our, in our field office tech guide. So if your ag producers are out there and they're doing something that's not currently available in our, um, our suite of practices, then let's talk about it. Let's let's talk about what we need to do to um, put a proposal together to how we can you know, take that innovative idea and get it tested. And um, so it would be um, a, a potentially uh, accepted into our uh, tech guide. So that would be the Conservation Innovation Grant, CIG. So on the uh, Conservation Collaboration Cooperative Agreements this year, um, we did have an announcement and it closed last Friday. So we currently received some proposals and I'm uh, working through those with the um, review committee. So it'll be um, It'll be a little bit before we'll have some time to get through the review process and, and working with the Grants and Agreements Division to get those available. But I'm really excited about it and uh, I look forward to seeing what everyone has in those proposals. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give an email or call back. Thanks. All right. Thank you much, Colette. All right, Kent, have you figured out your PowerPoint yet? Kent, if you're talking, you're on mute still. All right. Kent's throwing his computer in the trash. Right <laughs> we also we also had another uh, uh, field representative from one of our, our senators arrive. Uh, Jim, did you want to address the group at all? No, sir, I don't really have anything for the group today. All right, well, we appreciate your attendance, so thank you. Yeah, I apologize for being late. I lost track of time. I was busy doing other stuff, and then I realized that I was late, so. Oh, no worries. We just appreciate that you're here, so thank you. Uh, all right, well, Jeff, we're going to go ahead and move into you until Ken can figure out his PowerPoint. You bet, no problem. <clears throat> all right, good morning, everybody. I uh, hope you're having a good day out there. Um, quick update on the... Uh, conservation implementation strategy. Um, did a little something different this year. We we did um, a, a pre-proposal process and uh, those were due, boy, I want to say back in uh, April, I believe, or maybe March, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and we got 40, 41 pre-proposals submitted. So I want to thank everybody that submitted one. We had a bunch of partners along with a bunch of NRCS folks put proposals together. So we really, really appreciate seeing that many proposals get submitted. Uh, we had a review committee <clears throat> go through and and kind of look and and I won't really say rank, but sort of you know made selections on which pre-proposals uh, we would ask back to submit full proposals. And so we've asked 20 of those uh, folks to take their pre-proposals and turn them into full proposals. And those full proposals are due July 1st. And so uh, if any of you out there have, you know, written one and are working on the full proposal and, uh, you know, would like some some guidance, um, some, an opportunity to ask some questions or to discuss your proposal in any way, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and we'll be glad to try to, you know, answer whatever questions you have or kind of guide you in the right direction on on your uh, full proposal. Um, with that, you know, once we get those in in July, we'll go through a process again to make selections. 
uh, with the intent of having those selections out by early August so that uh, those that do get selected will have an opportunity to start the planning process, start the outreach process, uh, start you know communicating uh, with with the general public about the opportunity. So that'll all be coming here in the next couple of months and we should have uh, some some actual um, proposals to tell you about come come the next state tech in August. So just be aware of that. Our previous selections, um, we're kind of halfway through the funding process on our previous ones as far as the ranking and, and actual obligation process goes, because uh, it's just that time of year where we are actually obligating those contracts and and uh, we should start getting some stuff on the ground here pretty quick through those contracts. So excited about that opportunity and the results that will come out of that here in the future. So that's kind of a quick update. Um, you know, and to add to that, I guess one thing to mention, if it's not it's not too early to start thinking about a proposal for next year already, um, that those announcements usually come out in, in November. So if you wanna have a conversation about an idea you have, uh, willing to discuss that idea too and get you ready for that uh, announcement that'll likely come out in November as well. So never too early to start thinking about next year when it comes to uh, CIS and projects like that. So give me a call if you need something or shoot me an email. All the above works. So thank you, sir. All right. So are there are there any questions at this point from the group regarding uh, the CIS process or CS in general? Thank you, Colette. Colette has posted a, a link to the CIS webpage uh, in the chat if anybody's interested in learning more about our CIS process. Uh, Jeff, do you want to go ahead and continue on with uh, your program's update? You bet. Didn't know if we were skipping back to cancer or not, so I paused. Okay, so um, RCPP update. Uh, let's start with the um, proposals that uh, got submitted. We had um, four proposals recently that were submitted. Uh, three of them uh, were South Dakota only, and one of them was a multi-state proposal. So there's a, a total of four proposals that were submitted. Two of those proposals were alternative funding arrangements, and two of them were RCPP classic type uh, proposals. So right now we are in the review process where each state has the opportunity to look at the proposals that were submitted and provide comments back to national headquarters. Um, the headquarters folks or the chief really uh, is the person that makes a selection on RCPP. It is not left up to the individual states. So we provide our comments back and then, uh, you know, those are taken into account uh, with the chief when he makes his selections. Uh, there was a little over $300 million available for RCPP, and uh, we can have up to 15 alternative funding arrangements selected. So uh, I would say we have an above average chance of, of having at least one of our AFA proposals selected for funding. And of the two classics, uh, I would say there's a fairly good chance that at least one of those two would be funded as well, if not both. Uh, the numbers of applications or proposals submitted this year was down from previous years. Uh, I think some of that has to do with the um, the one billion dollar climate smart egg opportunity that's out there. I know a lot of partners were um, were jumping on that boat, and I'm I'm glad to hear that as well. I just know it. I think it reduced our number of uh, RCPP applications as well. Uh, as far as our, our current RCPP projects go, it's, I'm kind of excited to announce that we're finally getting to the point where um, two of our projects are actually taking applications, ranking applications, and are ready to start obligating contracts. Uh, and those two would be the, the Big Sioux water quality project and the uh, Belfouche River water quality project. So. Those two projects are kind of um, leading the way here in South Dakota as far as this, this whole new RCPP process that we've had to work through. So 
we've got the agreements in place and those two are are ready to start obligating contracts. Um, one of our other ones with Ducks Unlimited that covers pretty much all of eastern South Dakota, uh, parts of North Dakota and Montana as well is an alternative funding arrangement. And that one too will be announcing a sign up period here very shortly. That should be coming out any day now. Um, that one is, like I said, it's an alternative funding arrangement. So DU has those funds. DU will do the ranking. DU will do the obligating of the contracts and working directly with the producers. So NRCS is providing funding and NRCS is providing some technical oversight to the project, but it is pretty much a DU project as, as those dollars basically go directly to Ducks Unlimited to work directly with producers and getting conservation on the ground. So very excited that we're finally getting to the point of, of making some of this happen. Uh, to go along with that, a quick kind of personnel announcement. Um, Cresha Letty, she's our district conservationist up in the Millbank office. Uh, she'll be working here out of the Huron office for the next 120 days as the RCPP coordinator. So she'll be helping me out uh, working with our existing projects as well as those four proposals that we have in the system and uh, working with those folks that they get selected. So excited to have Cresha on board. Uh, she actually doesn't start till June 5th, but so she'll start here in a couple of weeks, but excited about that opportunity to uh, have a little more assistance to work directly with partners in getting RCPP uh, really rolling here in South Dakota. So again, if anybody out there is thinking about RCPP in the future, it's never too early to start thinking about it. Uh, those proposals take a little bit to put together. And again, myself uh, or Cresha would be glad to work with you guys and uh, help you start uh, at least putting an outline together for a proposal here in the near future. So keep that in mind. I have no idea when the next announcement will be. I imagine it'll be sometime in 2023, but uh, wouldn't hurt to start thinking about ideas. So let me know if you got any and be glad to discuss those with you. So thank you. We can, uh, Jen, you yeah. Go ahead and go to your team. Yeah, let's, Jen's up next. So we'll turn it over to Jen. And she can give you a quick update on Equip. Good morning, everyone. I. I don't have a lot to share for EQIP. Like Jeff mentioned, we're kind of in the thick of things right now uh, in getting contracts obligated for fiscal year 22. Um, we unfortunately did not receive any additional funding in our first fund assessment request, but uh, we are gonna proceed moving forward with what we can. Uh, we've got about half of our CIS projects ranked and moving forward half of them are still in the process of getting ranked so that we can select for funding there uh, all of our general funds are being selected and, and working towards contracts right now as well so uh, unless you guys have any other questions for equip that's about all i would have to share this this time anybody on the call have any questions for jennifer for, for equip So just a quick comment at this point, um, yeah, we're not taking any action as far as any kind of disaster sign up like you heard about with ECP from Owen. Um, we're not really sure if there's much of a place for EQIP in that role at this point, but if anybody has some feedback or information on specific things that were damaged, we could certainly look at opportunities, um, but no action at this point is being taken directly to for um, dealing with a disaster that kind of rolled through here last week. So just want to let you guys all know that. We're open to it. If you've got something or or can let us know about something specific, but at this point we don't have anything specific planned for equip and dealing with the disaster that kind of rolled through. So yeah, if there's a specific contract holder out there that was affected, they can certainly visit with their local office and or Jeff or I, and we can figure out what we can or can't do to, to assist them too. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Looks like next on the list is Joyce oh. with a conservation stewardship program update. Good morning. 
We, I do have a hand, uh, hand a sheet in the handouts that does go through the CSB classic um, allocation that we did receive this year. I will try to share that quickly just to run through it with you. Um, we did do an early sign up this year with the CSP classics, trying to get the obligations done early enough that we could actually maybe get some more money later in the summer or at least have time during the summer to work with the producers. So our application deadline for the classic was January 21st this year. We had 523 applications and our initial allocation was 8,640,000. So um, we had an organic allocation of 200,000, but we did not receive an application for that. So we did have to return those funds. Our obligation deadline was April 29th for the first allocation amount. We funded 59 contracts with that money. We received an additional 4 million 4,000 on May 9th, and it looks like we're going to get 19 more, con 19 more contracts out of that. We put that obligation deadline at June 3rd. So I do have a chart here for you that you can look at, and this is just the first allocation that 8.640 uh, 800, 8,640,000, I can't even talk about it. Anyway, and then on the bottom, I did separate out the beginning farmer rancher and the socially disadvantaged, so you, you can see what was actually spent towards those two. Um, then on the CSP renewals, we actually have had an application deadline of April 15th for the 2023 renewals. We did receive 333 applications and that obligation deadline will be after October 1st. We don't know exactly what that will be right now, but they can, the field officers can move ahead on working on those applications and we don't know our allocation either, but that's what I know for right now. So if there's any questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Joyce. Any any questions from the group, for Joyce, regarding conservation stewardship program? All right, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, we have Brandon with the uh, agricultural conservation easement program and haying mowing requirements on easements. I know Brandon was traveling today. You didn't know if he'd be able to join us or not, so I'm not sure if he's on for sure. If not, I'll cover it for him. I don't see him jumping. No, nope, I don't here. see him jumping up either. So a uh, quick update on um, ASAP. Uh, specifically, what I'd like to mention is um, some new guidance that came out um, concerning compatible use agreements. Uh, and and the dates that uh, producers would be allowed to hay uh, their conservation easements. Um, if you guys, some of you may or may not remember last year during the drought, um, you know, obviously the number of requests that we had for haying and grazing easements increased uh, due to, you know, kind of lack of vegetation out there for livestock. Um, and what that ended up leading to was some confusion between uh, when the south, when the state allows uh, vegetation to be used on their properties versus when we allow vegetation to be used in CRP. Uh, those dates were different as well as the easement dates that would allow for hang of easements was different and that caused a lot of confusion for for some of our producers. So. One thing that has happened is our headquarters has come out and asked that each state align uh, their easement mowing dates to match up with the CRP dates unless we have specific reasons not to have those dates match up. So yesterday uh, we actually held a subcommittee meeting uh, with several individuals to discuss what direction South Dakota wants to go with uh, these dates that will allow uh, producers to hay their easements. And I need to be very specific. This does not affect grazing of our easement. It only affects haying 
so that you guys are aware that uh, there is a there is a difference between the two when it comes to our compatible use agreements. So um, currently, uh, prior to this uh, bulletin coming out uh, advising us to change the dates, our date to begin paying a NRCS easement was July 15th. And currently the the uh, first date that you can hay CRP is August 2nd. So there is a two week, essentially a two week difference in those dates. So during the subcommittee uh, meeting, uh, of course, a lot of different things got discussed. Uh, what I would tell you right now, um, we've been made aware of some maybe research uh, slash literature review that would discuss when uh, nesting birds actually complete the nesting process to where uh, mowing of an easement or mowing of any kind would not actually be detrimental to that wildlife species. So um, rather than um, have to maybe change a whole lot of things right off the get go, what we are going to do is we're going to ask our headquarters for basically a bit of an extension to let this research uh, play out and give us the science that uh, would would basically solidify the date that we pick to allow Hank to to begin on our easement. So we're going to ask basically for a two year extension not to change our dates at this point, pending the outcome of this uh, research that's being completed. And I've got I've got that research that I can attach to my request up to headquarters. So currently that's kind of the recommendation that's coming from the subcommittee. Um, obviously, if there's anybody on here that would like to provide us additional comments, we're certainly open to that. But it, our fear is that if we change the dates now and that literature comes out and maybe would support our current date, you know, now we change the dates, now we would change the dates back. Uh, we wanted to avoid a whole lot of confusion that potentially could happen there. Um, so that is currently the route that we are planning to take. I will tell you, just like I told the subcommittee yesterday, just because that's what we propose does not mean that we will get approval for that. And we may have to still switch to the August 2nd date, uh, but we are going to at least make a request or, or you know, kind of try to get a short extension to making that change just in the off chance that the research that's just about done would would actually support our July 15th date. So uh, that's our plan. If anybody's got questions on it, be happy to take those now. Uh, or if you've got comments that you would like to provide me uh, in support of or against our plan, I'd be open to those as well. And last thing I'll say before we start taking those comments in your handouts, there is a map too that shows the different um, nesting dates currently uh, so that you can see where we fall in as compared to the other states around us as well. So, you know, take a look at that. That's those those nesting dates are what drives the. Um, the uh, our ability to begin mowing or yeah, basically mowing or hanging an easement. So take a look at that. And if anybody's got comments or questions, I will certainly be open to them. So any any questions or comments or feedback for Jeff at this point? And as you have a chance to look at the doctor, the, the handout, if you have questions later, Jeff, Jeff will take uh, questions via email also. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, Kent, are you ready to give this a try one more time? Yes, I certainly hope so. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to advance my slide if someone will let me know if they can actually see it this time. Bingo. Yes, we can see it. Yeah. OK, you can see it advance. OK, great. So let's try this again. Sorry for wasting everyone's time. I'll be uh, be efficient and uh, brief with my presentation here. Um, so anyways, the soil health principles is what we've been covering. And today we're going to cover the, the fifth principle, is, which is livestock integration. 
And um, like I said, it's one that's uh, near and dear to my heart uh, because I love working with producers and adopting this principle. And um, here we go. So livestock integration, a uh, picture of some of my girls where apparently that didn't go through the last time. So this is where we're going to get started. Why do we integrate livestock? Um, it's, a, it's a question we often get, especially with our with our row crop producers, but if they don't have livestock, why do I need livestock on my cropland? What's the importance of that? And usually what I try and do uh, working with producers is remind them of this. This is why we need livestock on our land. Um, here in South Dakota, we're fortunate to have very productive soils, very resilient soils, and we can thank hundreds and thousands of years of grassland and large herds roaming across the landscape, managing our soils essentially for us. We had bison, pronghorn, elk. Um, even we even have to look at our, our turkeys and grouse, our our fowl friends. So they were all out on the landscape. Large herds of bison are grazing. Bison are grazing, and as they're grazing, they're they're doing the, many things that impact the soil. Uh, they're uh, eating and processing that that above ground growth for us, and that's returning back to the soil. So when we think livestock. Um, Certainly I do I, when I when I do in South Dakota, I'm guilty of primarily thinking of, of our beef and it's certainly one that's most visible in the landscape and probably our our, our largest uh, animal operations in, in the state have these. So one of the important reasons we have livestock and integrate them into our cropland systems is that they can actually process a lot of that above ground dry matter during what I call the off season or when it's cold or when it's dry. So if you've if you've got a producer, for example, that's adopted cover crops, but they don't have livestock, a lot of those cover crops over the winter months are just kind of sitting there idle. There's not really much going on. Yes, they're providing cover, um, but they're not cycling back into into our soil to make it more productive and healthy. Livestock can do that. They have a warm, moist environment, moist environment in their gut, and they process that, and it comes out the back end in the form of the the perfect fertilizer. This is uh, this is a slide. I, I promise we won't get too much into the weeds on this one, but it's a very important one. It's one I talk about with our our, our feeding operation, our, our CAFOs in the state on a regular basis on why it's important to have manure and livestock on our cropland. This is uh, from the Hoosfield Experiment Station. It's in the UK, probably one of the oldest egg experiment stations um, in the world. And what this graph is showing is that in when this when this experiment station started in 1852, they had essentially three different plots, and one of the plots received no manure. Two of the plots received manure on a regular basis for the first 20 years. After that 20 years, one of the plots that had been receiving manure no longer had manure applied on a regular basis or at all. And you can see that red arrow there shows when that stopped and where those two lines, top lines, diverge. Okay, so then if you fast forward over 100 years later, you can see that the plot that continued to receive manure continued to rise and kind of plateaued out eventually. But the plot that had received manure and no longer received manure for 100 years still had a higher organic matter level than our bottom line. So. What I, what I try to point out is that manure is important in our systems. Um, it has a long term effect on the health of our systems and in our organic matter sequestration. OK, another reason we want to integrate livestock into our cropland is that it adds value to our cropland. Uh, this is a, a photo from the James River Valley of cover crops that have been planted after a small grain, and this producer then grazes those in the fall. So I know many of you are, will hear if you're working with producers uh, trying to encourage them to add uh, small grains into their operation, into their rotation. A lot of times you'll hear you hear them say, well, I, I don't believe that small grains are profitable or I, I can't make much money on those. Well, I, I tend to disagree and, and the reason behind that is because we can manage those, we can have cover crops following those and we can graze those, which then adds value onto that cropland that you attribute back to the, the gain in the livestock. Um, we do see on a regular basis many people that aftermath graze, especially their corn stocks. And while I love to see that, I think we have a we have another opportunity 
uh, on those corn acres for livestock grazing um, after corn harvest if you have interseeded cover crops prior to harvest. And this is a great photo why I think if you were any form of livestock and you were turned out on this field, um, it would be a, a literal smorgasbord for you. It's got green growing plants, it's got dry matter that will be harvested and available for them also. And so it's kind of that perfect balanced diet for our livestock. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about beef. Let's not forget about the other livestock that we have here in South Dakota. This is just a couple of examples, goats, sheep, and certainly any of our fowl friends, uh, chickens, turkeys, all of that stuff we need to have adopted into our, into our landscapes. And really this goes back to the principle of maximizing diversity. All of these livestock have different services that they provide for the landscape. Um, we look at uh, turkeys and chicken, you know, they're going to be eating a lot of those pest insects that maybe we don't want in the landscape. Well, we all know that goats and sheep are going to eat very different plants and select for different plants than uh, beef are going to, for example. And they're also going to process those plants differently and apply them back on the landscape for us. Okay, so the big question is, how do we do this? How do we integrate these, these livestock onto our cropland acres? Uh, the first thing that many uh, producers are going to think of is, well, I don't have the, the field fenced. The fence had been taken out long ago when we started row cropping and we don't have water. Um, so really that's what I encourage producers to do is think on a temporary basis on this infrastructure. infrastructure. Temporary fencing, we have great suppliers out there for uh, lots of different turbo wire, hot wire that can be applied really quickly and is very effective. We can do temporary water systems above ground pipeline if you've got a, a water source close by and temporary uh, tanks. Uh, for the most part, we really don't want permanent structure on our cropland because we're going to need to be able to drive over those acres with our equipment the following year to plant and harvest. So think on a temporary basis, um, but a lot of this stuff can be very effective. Crop rotation. If you're a corn soybean rotation, it's going to be a little tougher to adopt livestock integration. What do you need to do to, to make that work? Can you diversify your, your crop rotation by adding small grains? Can you diversify your rotation by adding cover crops through interseeding? Those are things that you need to be thinking in advance of. Cover crops and interseeding is something that we need to think of if you look at the, the bottom right photo there. Um, I, I think there's a lot of promise with this. I know there's um, there can be some headaches with the adoption and the, and the learning curve with using this, um, but I've seen some promising results uh, throughout the state. Integrating perennials into our cropland systems. This is something that um, it, it's almost a land use change, um, but I think there's lots of opportunity, especially in James River Valley with our saline problems. Um, perennial vegetation to restore those saline acres doesn't mean that those acres are not productive. You can still use those for haying and or for grazing and still make uh, still make some money off those acres while you're restoring and hopefully mitigating the, the salinity problems. The last thing to think about is management, management, management. So it's kind of like in real estate where they say location, location, location. Anytime you're adopting livestock into your cropland, management is, is the primary thing that you really need to focus on. And it's an area that I see where it produces our adopting this and they're putting livestock on their cropland. This is where I see the most area for improvement. And um, I also see this as an area where a lot of producers kind of give up sometimes because it didn't work. Well, this is something we need to try, try and try again. OK, get creative with your infrastructure. Um, this is a, a producer from over by the, the Arlington area, and it, it's really kind of a traveling power source and feed source. You can see you can see the old tractor here and you can see it's got a feed wagon behind it and it's a traveling power source. And this is what he moves throughout the field as he's moving livestock. And so this is certainly a very creative solution um, to, to a problem that this producer had. OK, this is um, just a really great photo of, of management and really intensive management on, on cover crop acres and cropland. This is from uh, Blue River Ranch. And so uh, many of you were on their, their tour they had last fall. And so what you're looking at here is the herd is kind of focused in this area um, and it's basically a half mile long, um, I'd say by roughly 150 feet wide. And, the, and this herd has access to this area for, for roughly 12 hours, give or take, and then they will move on to the next side. 
and they can go back for water, but they only go back for a day or two. And so you can see where I have the red lines drawn there. The red line on the right is where there is actual a fence, so they, they cannot cross back through there. The red line on the left, actually there is no fence. They can go back to the previous day's grazing, but they really have no reason to. They stay on the area where the fresh growth is for, for grazing, and they only go back for water. Uh, this is another photo. This is from the, the demonstration farm here south of Huron by the Beetle Conservation District. And this is a Syria Ryan vetch mix that was grazed in the fall or in the spring, excuse me. And then when that is done, uh, they follow that up with a with another cover crop mix that is then grazed in the fall. And so you can see it's a it's a creative way. It's a flexible way of managing some cropland acres. Uh, this picture is from last year, and so we all know that it was pretty dry. And so if if you, for example, had planted that cereal rye with the intent of seeding into that your soybeans the next year, but you get really dry and you don't think it's going to be or make any sense to plant those soybeans, you can let the cereal rye come and turn your livestock out on there and then plant cover crops when that growth is done. And so they, it provides some flexibility by adopting livestock into your operation on cropland. OK, so this is a video. This is from uh, Jesse Hall. And it's a, it's a great video because it shows how, how the livestock, they all look fat and happy, right? And they're grazing on this great green growth. And this was even in a, this is a photo from la, or video from last year. And so it's a drought year. You can still see cover crops can be successful even in a drought year or drier than normal. You'll notice again that they are all basically staying in where the cover crop growth is fresh and lush. Um, there's a line you can see right there, almost right through the middle of the photo. And there is no fence there, but they have no reason to go back there. They stay and they separate themselves out and they stay on the fresh acres. OK, so if a producer absolutely cannot adopt livestock or don't have the time or the resources or just don't want to have livestock out on their cropland, this is the next best, best option. And this is through the application of manure. Um, hopefully the proper application of manure um, where you are measuring the nutrient contact content of what you're applying and applying it at the right rate. Um, we have a fantastic egg waste and, or egg nutrient management team out of Mitchell that will, will work with producers on this. So if you can't get actual hoof out on the ground, this is the next best best option. OK, so to summarize and wrap it up here, this is uh, you see two photos side by side. One is a photo I took when I was at a conference here several years ago. I'm in the Mankato area and I was out for some morning exercise. And as I was walking down the sidewalk, I, I saw this uh, sign here by a landscape center, pulverized black dirt, and I kind of got a little chuckle, so I took a photo of it. Um, and the photo on the right, you don't have this in your hand house just because I just added this. Uh, this is a photo I actually took out yesterday when I was out collecting samples. Um, this is not too far away from Huron, but I, I see this all over the place. I travel around the state quite a bit. This is a common occurrence that I've seen this year. This sign should really be on this field also. We don't have to have this. I think we all know this. Um, we know that we can we can affect change. We know that we can adopt these principles, that the principles are profitable. And not only are they profitable, but they're sustainable over the long term. We don't need to have bare ground like this anymore. This is a planted field. Um, enough is enough, in my opinion. We know how to do this. We have five principles of soil health. Um, most of us are in the in the world of working with producers and adopting these. We really need to encourage to adopt all five. If you adopt all five, you can promise and I can promise that this system will work. There's many ways to adopt each principle, so there's not a one, one, one size fits all. Um, it's us for, uh, up to us as planners and professionals in the ag and conservation world to work with our producers and hopefully affect some change out there in the landscape. So with that, I'll leave it open for any questions or comments. And if there aren't any, certainly there's my contact information. You can either email me there or contact me through phone. Uh, thank you for your time, everyone. And with that, I will turn it back. Hey, Kent, I'm going to stick you on the spot just for one question. Over, sure. over this last week, we, we had a pretty major storm that came through, and there's a lot of pictures that were popping up on the news of a, of a large dirt storm that was going over Sioux Falls. Do you have yep. any thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> I do. My first thought is we should know better. Um, 
we have all the tools where that doesn't need to be happening anymore. Um, I, I think that we all see that. I think everyone recognizes that it's not good, but I think we have short memories and we just kind of move on. Um, I, I think we really need to we really need to focus on that. You know, our, our agency was basically formed to stop that erosion event that we saw and we saw multiple times throughout this spring. Um, and and I, and I think sometimes that. Uh, sometimes we see it, we know it's bad, but we say, oh, well, there's nothing that could have been done about it. That's just kind of an act of God or a freak storm. Um, but we all know that that soil is not coming from fields that had last year's cover crop residue on them or that were no till with a lot of residue on there. Um, those events don't need to happen. We've got all the tools to stop it. Let's let's work towards that change. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. All right, so any any questions or comments for for Kent? All right. We'll go ahead and and continue down the agenda then. So next on the agenda is Laura Stern with uh, a lateral effects policy update. All right, thank you, Tony. Good morning to everybody. NRCS is nearing completion of our project to provide consistent lateral effect information to producers in the trade cost region, which includes the states of North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Minnesota. In the past, there have been concerns raised from stakeholders that setback information was inconsistent among the four states, uh, that it was delivered by different means, and that it changed over time without notification. In response to this, the four states have standardized the equations and procedures for calculating drainage setbacks, and they've been formalized in a common four-state supplement to the National Engineering Index. The setback databases have been calculated on the current soil survey data and will remain static. They will only be updated upon agreements of the state conservationists for Iowa, Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota when there's a clear need to do so. Although some setback distances may have changed for some soils, the differences are minimal. Um, also, all four states will also direct producers to a common website. And on this common website, then producers and contractors will be able to retrieve information that's readily accessible. And should they have any questions about information that they're getting off that website, the website will also direct them back to their local NRCS office. For any questions they might have about setback distances or planned drainage projects. The website is planned to go live in June, so I can't demonstrate it for you today or show it today, but I sure could do that at a future meeting if there was interest in doing that and seeing it. So, all right, have... thank you, Laura. Any uh, any questions at all for Laura at this point? It, we really are just trying to do an update or or get the information out that there has been an update to the policy, and there's going to be more information that will be coming as the website becomes live. But does anybody have any questions right now? We might be able to address a question or at least take a note that we can get more additional information if we don't have an answer. It looks like we did have a question in there, Laura. So what is the static date for the soils information? Do you have, no, do you know that? November 2021. All right, any other questions? And if you do have questions as you think about the presentation or the update, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. You can contact, uh, you can send an email to me or Laura, would you be willing to take some emails also? Yes, that would be fine. Okay, Laura, if you could, would you put your, your email address just into the chat so that if folks did have questions regarding this, they could contact you? Yes. Great, thank you so much. All right, so we'll go ahead and move down the agenda then to Deke Hobbick with an update on South Dakota wetlands HEL compliance.
All right, <clears throat> so here's the screen. This is the kind of the update I give every time. It's just our wetland workload or compliance workload. So we'll start with the wetland work. Um, you got your 569s there. Obviously includes carryover from 2021 in our numbers, but uh, we do have a few more uh, 569s this year than in most years. So we got 18 in progress and uh, move on to 1026s. You know, this number, you know, we averaged probably around 1,400 the last, well, the last eight years. Uh, this is down just a little bit. Um, it could increase, though, at any time. Once planting's done, it seems like people tend to come in and request more wetland delineations to determine what they can and cannot do on their fields. Um, request age is looking pretty good. Um, everything's kind of getting held within the four months for sure, but most of everything's getting answered in that uh, one, two, and three. Move down to highly erodible land, and we do a lot of these ATL determinations. Uh, we only, you know, got 1,098 completed, nine outstanding, you know, 673 new breakings, and 180 of those, 108 of those are determined ATL. Um, understand that when we do HEL determinations, it's usually involving, you know, land that hasn't obviously had a determination done on it, and many times it is a new breaking. So that's all I have for the numbers. Anybody got any questions dealing with any sort of compliance in the state? So, Deke, you have a question. Uh, how many acres of new HEL? Yeah, I don't track that. We'd have to get FSA um, to determine what they have for for what their fields are getting broke out for HEL. So, I don't know. Is Owen still on? No. Yes, I am. I am Deke. Okay. I don't have that information at my fingertips, but it's something that we could look at. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I didn't figure you probably did, but uh, right, it should be some way to compare annually the difference in HEL acres on the land. So. So, follow up question: Would those be grassland acres? Yeah, I mean, more often than not, I mean, if the field hasn't been determined, um, the acres that are being broke or some sort of grassland that hasn't broke. In a lot of times, it's smaller areas that are, you know, farmsteads, windbreaks, things like that. But there's no doubt if you go around, there's plenty of grassland being uh, being farmed this year that hasn't in the past. So it's anything from a tenth of an acre to one acre to a quarter. Right. Any other questions for Deke at this time? All right. So at this point, I'd like to move into partnership reports. I'm asking Colette to go ahead and lead the process for me. So Colette, if you could take it, I'd appreciate it. Great. So good morning again, everyone. So um, the State Technical Committee has been a wonderful uh, venue for sharing information with our constituents. And I just wanted to take this time along with the rest of the leadership team to um, invite some of our partners to provide updates. So I thought we would do um, kind of a round robin style, just in nothing real in depth, but uh, a few little updates of what your organization is about, because this particular platform, we have a lot of leaders in South Dakota here today, and we have a lot of support staff here too. And many of you are uh, working on um, things that are unique to your agency or organization. That's terrific. And many of you are working on projects through agreements with us, and that's awesome too. And, and we just would like to take this time to uh, share a little bit of information because the ultimate goal is that as we communicate more, then we have the opportunity to help all of our ag producers, farmers, ranchers, local foods, folks, whoever, to help them to have more conservation in their life, which will be healthier natural resources, 
which will lead to a more sustainable operation and be productive and provide food and fiber for our world. So if you would please just um, turn your camera on and I'll recognize you and you can uh, take a few minutes to hear what everybody's um, what's going on in their organization. So if you're ready, please turn your camera on and we can um, go from there. If you don't have a camera uh, option, you can just do a, um, a microphone as well. So. Hi, Kevin. I see your camera's on. I, I guess we're going to thank you. Well, thank you, Colette. And uh, Tony, nice to meet you virtually. I know we had a meeting scheduled for last week. I'm Kevin Roebling, uh, Secretary of Game Fish and Parks. Uh, what a fantastic group of folks here today. And I just really appreciated the conversation and the presentations on especially livestock integration. I just moved all my cows to pasture on Sunday, actually. So I am a big big player in that as well and I, I truly appreciate all those efforts as far as soil health and, and the messages that this group and others have been sharing across South Dakota and this nation. Um, we can make a difference and we are making a difference and I am a true believer of that in our farming practices and making sure that we look at the profitability of producers as the number one goal but then habitat conservation as a byproduct of that goal. So super exciting times across South Dakota um, and I'm very happy to lead the team here at Game Fish and Parks and really focus on that. Uh, we are laser focused on habitat, habitat, habitat. And uh, what comes along with that is access of hunting as well and fishing and trapping and uh, looking at all those things combined. Um, it's an exciting time because I feel like the messages from all these agencies across you know, the state have are, are singing the same, they're singing out the same sheet of music in a sense. And that has been very beneficial. Our partners have been fantastic. I'm looking at a bunch of partners on the phone right now or on this call right now and they've been helping us sell those habitat programs um, we've reprioritized people within the agencies uh, we have uh, eight more private lands biologists we have uh, wildlife damage specialists conservation officers wildlife biologists all talking to producers about habitat and conservation and profitability and all of those things that this group is very focused on um, it is the number one priority in the wildlife division, no doubt. And we are really hoping to meet the producers where they're at, not necessarily making them come to us. So it's a proactive approach. We're knocking on doors, sitting at coffee tables, and developing those needed relationships across this state and having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And it's starting to pay dividends, and I'm very excited to see what those results look like, not just this year, but five years from now. Um, those are some of the things that we're actively working on within the department. Uh, the Working Lands Program, CREP, uh, was mentioned already by Owen, and uh, also Woody Habitat Development and Grass, 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 Grass. I'm actually going to a Grassland Summit uh, next week in Fort Collins, um, and I think there's a there's a lot to be said there um, with the with the storms that were occurred East River and that big dust cloud people seen. Uh, obviously, I, there, we've talked about that already, and it's very tried and true. So. Yeah, I mean, the department is very, very focused on this habitat component and looking at profitability and making sure that uh, we we integrate livestock. That was a great presentation, by the way, and into those types of conversations. So a couple other things we're keeping a close eye on, uh, Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Uh, this is in Congress right now. Uh, this could potentially bring, oh, in the tune of about $16 million to the state wildlife agency, uh, Game Fish and Parks, to help manage, um, they're called the greatest conservation species, uh, greatest concert needs species. Uh, there's 110 of them in our wildlife action plan. Um, things like the Dakota skipper, things like you know non-game in a sense species that uh, aren't directly being targeted with license dollars uh, that we we utilize so you know so heavily in the department across the state. So. We're keeping a close eye on that. That is actually going to be likely up for vote in the Senate here. They're talking within the next month, and I see Ryan is on, and, and I'm sure he knows a lot about this as well. So that would be a, a big uh, shot in the arm. I, I'll use that as far as what type of dollars that can be spent on, and a lot of that could be habitat. A lot of that could be the things we're talking about right now. And then the byproduct, obviously, is going to be benefiting both game, non-game uh, producers, uh, be direct, you know, landowner payments, those sorts of things. So looking at that, keeping a close eye on it, um, the Big Sur River CREP was already mentioned. That's out for uh, EA right now, and uh, we'll have some public comments on that. We should be 
closing that in the next, oh, I think Mark, 30 days and correct me if I'm wrong. And then we should have things lined out hopefully by July. And we're hoping that we can hit the ground running this fall with enrollments already. And that's a very exciting project, 25,000 acres along the Big Sioux River. Um, we are going to work very, very, very hard on uh, reaching out to producers, meeting producers and talking to them about those opportunities of putting you know, perennial grass, 15 year commitment on the landscape with public access along with it. So lots of exciting things happening within the department. Um, yeah, we're, we're just so excited to really, really focus on habitat because we know it is the foundation of wildlife management and uh, it always will be, and we need to really put our eggs in that basket and we are. So any questions from anyone in regards to game fish and parks? All righty. Well, thanks, Colette, for the opportunity, and I'll let the next person go. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. You're welcome. So um, we'll hop on over to the Association of Conservation Districts with Angela. Please. Good morning. Um, I have with me today Noli Kelly Tassler, who is our NOLO coordinator now. She's working on her non-operating landowner uh, project, and we're extending that and trying to build that uh, group of people that are interested that don't own land, but also still manage land, or they own land, but they don't actually manage it on a on daily basis. So Kelly's gonna be working on that project with us, which is a collaborative conservation agreement. Uh, behind me, you see a sign that says, where good things grow. I just wanna highlight that project. You should be seeing those um, advertisements or PSAs on all the radio stations around, not the radio, sorry, television stations around the state. They've been playing them quite, uh, we had five series there. And I think it's really receiving broad support. We're getting good feedback on that program and getting a lot of people sign up that are interested. Do you want to say anything quick, Kelly? Okay. <laughs> I didn't tell her she was going to do this until a few minutes ago. A um, couple other items that I want to mention. You mentioned about the big dust clouds. Uh, the conservation districts are seeing an increase in our sediment and erosion control complaints, and they are working through those as they can. Um, we are providing additional training to the conservation districts in coordination with the Department of Ag and Natural Resources so that the conservation districts know what the law is, understand how to follow it, and make sure that we provide the best service to everyone while we're doing that. Final item is June is our month for area meetings. We have seven area meetings set from June 14th through June 23rd. And we'll be working with the conservation districts, providing them updates from ourselves as well as our partners. And um, if you want further information about those, let me know. Didn't want to take too much time. So uh, unless somebody has some questions, we are done. Just just a quick question or quick uh, comment, Angela. The, the videos <laughs> on where good things grow, great, great job on those. Um, if anybody hasn't had a chance to go to the Where Good Things Grow website and take a look at those those public service announcements, they're very well done. We had um, two retired F NRCS public affairs persons that worked on those, Lynn Betts and Ron Nichols. I agree, they're very well done, and um, I hope that we can continue those. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. And uh, yes, um, that was a, a really cool agreement that we that we're working on. I appreciate you folks carrying the ball and and making that happen. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for the Where Good Things Grow campaign to be expanded with our partners. And that's part of the reason why I was happy when you brought that up because I think that uh, it doesn't matter whether what part of South Dakota you're in, there are very good things that are growing here. Okay, um, I'm going to move over to. Um, Jim Ristow, he is working with South Dakota Corn. Good morning. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jim Ristow. I'm the Director of Sustainability for South Dakota Corn, and I work in uh, under an agreement and a partnership with uh, uh, NRCS. And uh, to advance, you know, trying to get better practices on the land uh, through the grower organizations. Um, I just was going to touch on a couple things we're involved with. We we were in support of a uh, RCPP project that American Coalition for Ethanol received in South Dakota, and um, 
that is not quite finalized, but uh, we're working through the details on that and trying to get it together. But basically, it's going to offer opportunities for producers in seven counties um, to be paid for adoption of uh, better practices or, or uh, climate smart practices, if you will. Uh, things like uh, 4R management, um, reduction in tillage, addition of cover crops, those sorts of things that we talk about in soil health. Uh, those counties are Brookings, Kingsbury, Lake, Minor, McCook, Minnehaha, and Moody. And there's a research component with this that will, uh, SDSU will be doing some work to, uh, to try to uh, capture some information as to what those practices mean as far as carbon life cycle analysis in the production of corn for, for ethanol. So there's a, the potential to take that and, and get credit through some of the existing marketplaces that are out there that are trying to um, reward uh, lower carbon fuel, uh, transportation fuel sources like in California. Um, that is also being looked at as kind of a pilot program, you know, with the recent Climate Smart grant announcement um, that was kind of replicated into a seven state project. So we'll see how that uh, turns out. Uh, we'll anticipate those grants. And, and then also there's another uh, grant that I was involved with uh, or I'm aware of that is seeking funding just to pay for cover crops. Uh, and that was submitted by uh, a coalition of groups, including corn, uh, soybeans, or National Corn Growers Association, National Soybean Board, and uh, the National Pork Board. So that's kind of neat to see a, a collaboration to uh, advance better practices on the land, such as cover crops. But thank you. Any questions for me? Yeah, it'd be fine. Okay, well, thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. So um, appreciate hearing about how things are, are working together and, and the other partners that are being brought into the project. That's really cool. So, all right. Um, I see that we have several other folks on the line. I'm going to recognize um, Sandy Smart, please. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sandy Smart. I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Program Leader for SDSU Extension. And um, we just completed uh, last week a series of face-to-face -face meetings with uh, drought concern out west. And um, those were very successful. I had partnerships with um, NRCS and FSA and talking about the different programs and opportunities. Um, obviously, we're responding to the derecho in, um, weather incident that we had uh, this week. And uh, there's some um, opportunities for some to, to interact with some uh, information that we have available on our website. Also, if you do know of anybody that might have had some livestock um, that uh, need to be housed somewhere else, I know you can contact Warren Rushi who has some um, knows of some available pen space if animals need to be moved. So he, he put that out there. Um, if you know anybody that's kind of in a bind there. Um, but yeah, it looks like uh, a lot of uh, property damage. Um, I, I know that um, I believe on our uh, extension radio network that Pam Gephardt does, uh, John Ball will be talking about um, trees and pretty much trees that are have any type of damage are, are most li likely not uh, salvageable. So, um, you know, those are going to be have to be um, cut down and disposed of. So a lot of shelter belts um, definitely are going to be affected. And the only, and like I said, the the one that occurred in Iowa uh, a few years back, uh, you know, occurred in August, and so it was really hard on a lot of those mature or maturing crops like corn. And of course, a lot of the deciduous trees we would have been in a much worse shape had they been fully leafed out. So um, I know there are still some people um, that might have been without power as of uh, Sunday or Monday and so hopefully they're restoring power to a few of those locations um, but yeah just to know that extension is available if you have 
um, contact some of our specialists at our eight regional centers and our state specialists. Um, the growing season is kind of, uh, for especially planting, is a little bit behind in certain areas. Um, uh, we're getting much needed moisture um, on the special the eastern side of the state. I had three quarters of an inch in my rain gauge this morning from yesterday. Um, you know, so it was kind of spotty. It looked like showers were um, south of I-90 um, over <laughs> yesterday morning. So anyway, um, things are starting to progress. Our entomologists are going to start doing some scouting and getting those scouting reports out there. So, um, you know, the I think the biggest issue um, is probably to get the pre-emergence herbicides down um, to get control. And I know that that's somewhat difficult, um, you know, with wet conditions, but uh, we're going to be in in a little bit of a bind uh, this summer as the post-emergence um, herbicides are, are probably not going to be available just to just because of supply chain issues. Um, and that's going to make weed control a challenge this summer um, and especially like in no-till situations. So um, just because the Roundup is so scarce. Um, so hopefully if your growers have gotten made purchases um, before the supply tightened, but and also we're going to see some challenges because of the war in Ukraine. Um, we're seeing issues with, um, you know, global markets and um, you know, disruptions in the supply chain. So I know that you'll continue to see high, probably higher prices, um, but we have high input costs that go along with that. So yeah, if, if you have information or just needing information, you can check out our our um, websites and we do have um, economic information on um, you know, different budgets for crops and livestock as well from the econ side of things. So I'll be happy to take any questions if there is. Well, thank you, Sandy. Um, and please, if, if anyone does have questions throughout the late, maybe you could raise your hand or or turn the camera on or something for any of the people that have provided updates, that'd be great. But we'll keep moving along here. Um, I do know that um, SDSU has had worked with the South Dakota Grassland Coalition, and I, I don't want to step on their toes by by saying this, but they had done, um, thanks for bringing it throughout, Sandy. Uh, the Grassland Coalition had orchestrated an effort earlier this spring for a um, outreach for grassland managers, and it's on a website called sddroughtplan.org. And they've just done a tremendous job of putting information out there on how to help people to to try to plan ahead and do some prevention before it gets to be really, really bad. Because even though we've had some moisture, um, we're still not as flush as we should be in, well, in much of the state. And then we have the extreme in the other part of the state. So anyway, um, so I will um, move over to um, uh, Bruce Toy, please. Morning, Colette. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Bruce Toy, the manager of conservation programs for Ducks Unlimited here in South Dakota. Uh, I thought I'd just give uh, a little, little more of an update. Uh, Jeff mentioned earlier our upcoming uh, RCPP project. Uh, maybe just add a little color to that, kind of tell you uh, what, what we're looking for and what the program is all about anyway. Uh, it is a three state proposal that includes South Dakota, North Dakota and Montana. Uh, South Dakota is the lead state. Uh, each each state is operating uh, somewhat independently. Uh, so with the lead state here, we're going to kind of get the get the ball rolling. This is a new program for for both sides. Uh, so a lot of things that we need to learn uh, learn through the process. Uh, so we're anticipating uh, kind of a soft rollout here in June. We'll probably have a a, a brief batching period uh, and a pretty uh, pretty restrictive. Uh, sort of screening criteria to really kind of flesh out uh, the best of the best type of projects and really hoping to, to start off with, the, you know, five or 10 good good projects to help us get our feet wet. But uh, what we're looking for, it's called scaling soil health in the soil in the prairie pothole region. So encouraging uh, producers that are transitioning uh, you know, from conventional towards regenerative farming systems, so practices like incorporating cover crops and reducing tillage. Uh, increasing crop diversity and getting livestock on, on those cropland acres as well. Um, the other component is grass restoration, so adding adding more grass into our grazing systems. 
Uh, one of the unique uh, opportunities we will have with this is, is, is not only uh, restoring grass through an equip practice like range planting, uh, but also coupling a, a CRP type rental payment uh, for for you know two to three to four years during that establishment phase. So so while that grass is is developing, the producer is not going to be out income for that that time period, and he can transition right into a, into a grazing system with the uh, with the infrastructure that we're helping him put on. So um, well, lots of lots of neat opportunities there um, that that will be good for the program. Uh, but with the with the, the screening criteria we're looking at, just to kind of give you an idea, um, we're looking for uh, producers that will be uh, using three of the four practices in a soil health system. Uh, so, you know, those four are, like I said, the cover crops, reducing tillage, uh, crop diversity and prescribed grazing. Uh, or if the producer is restoring a, at least 80 acres of grass in their system, they're going to help screen screen high in this process. And of course, if they're doing both of those, they're really going to be uh, you know the best of the best. Um, also looking for growers that are that are interested in collecting uh, data on site. So we want to do some soil sampling, kind of on a before and after scenario. These will likely be uh, five-year uh, conservation plans. So we want to collect data that we can uh, help show the, the the gains in soil health over that over that period. Uh, we're looking looking for growers that will be uh, uh, committed to attending soil health workshops put up by our partners. Uh, throughout the state, so connecting those folks to them, and really think that's going to help with long-term retention of these of these practices as well. Uh, perhaps even hosting, you know, workshops on on these sites that uh, have demonstration sites and that sort of thing. Um, also looking for a 10-year commitment from the grower, so an agreement to uh, uh, to keep grasslands as grass for 10 years and keep their wetlands as wetlands for 10 years. So adding a little bit of a time period to the to the standard, uh, you know, five-year equip type type of agreement. So. Um, if they're if they're saying yes to all those, they'll they'll likely screen high in our in our higher area priority counties, and and we'll be looking forward to uh, moving forward on those applications. But uh, if you have any questions on any of those, uh, you folks should sure reach out to me uh, uh, after after the meeting here. Thanks, Leah. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. That's great. So we're really really excited about that too. So looking forward to see it getting going. So. Okay, um, we're gonna move over to our friends over at DANR and um, Chris, if you're ready, we'll just get on the spot next. Yeah, so I just wanted to give an update. Um, Chris Dozark with uh, Department of Ag and Natural Resources work in the watershed protection uh, program. Um, so I'm in charge of administering our section 319 grant funding, um, which is basically a part of the Clean Water Act. Um, that points towards non-point source uh, pollution, I guess. And uh, basically we implement um, using EPA money. EPA money. So this year we were uh, allocated a little over 2.7 million. Um, we had three projects uh, that came in for requesting funds. Um, and it's pretty cool because most of these projects uh, kind of interlap with like RCPP and EQIP and other projects, you know, that everybody else is kind of working with. So um, with those three projects, uh, the Belfouche River watershed project, um, they're getting a pretty good chunk of money out of that uh, 2.7 million. They're gonna get uh, about 1.3 million uh, for implementation work here in the next three to five years. Uh, soil health improvement and planning project through the Soil Health, health Coalition came in. Um, they're going to get 123,000 um, uh, for an amendment for, you know, they're doing pretty good work. So they're uh, spending money. So they they came back in for some more and we amended, going to amend that project. And then the uh, South Central Watershed project um, kind of ran through the James River Water Development District. Uh, they came in and they're going to get uh, an additional 626,000. Uh, for the next couple of years as well. So just wanted to give an update on uh, those 319 projects. Um, the next, it'll be October 1st, will be the next uh, requ request for proposals. Uh, proposal applications will be October 1st, will be the next deadline for that. So um, just working on uh, getting our DANR's application in to uh, receive this money for the Section 319 funding. And then uh, we'll work with these three projects to get uh, amendment and uh, contracts done. So 
that's where we're sitting as far as uh, 319 projects go. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I see that we have a uh, hand up. Matt Morlock, did you have a question? Your hand is up. No, I'm just waiting for my turn. My camera, I went through my third camera now, so my camera's down again, so I don't have a camera to come up. So okay. I'll wait my turn. Sure. Um, did you have an update that you would like to share? Not to put you on the spot or anything. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, thanks everybody for those that don't know me. I'm Matt Morlock. I'm the stake coordinator for both of Dakotas. Um, for Pheasants Forever. Um, and you know, we're in that unique position where we really don't have our own programs. We just help sell all of your guys' programs. Um, and you know, just talking with staff over the last month, um, you know, I'd like you know, I'd like to report back that interest is still high. Um, they're all staying really busy. Lots of landowners wanting to do anything from re-enrollment of CRP to a lot of interest in grazing systems, um, planting cropland back for grazing, things like that. So um, I think like Sandy said, inputs um, and the high input costs are keeping a lot of folks in check um, and still wanting to do more. So I just want to quickly say, you know, interest is still high from what my team's saying. So all things are good and we're clicking on all cylinders. Oh, terrific, thank you. All right, so um, we will have Cindy next, and I just want to take this moment to say it, it's really cool to see how all of our partners are, you know, dovetailing things together. So people had mentioned, you know, providing, you know, projects and things, and like Bruce had mentioned about having the or an option for their producers to attend um, schools and training sessions. So we work very closely with the Soil Health Coalition and with the Grassland Coalition and other folks to put on those schools. And it's just really cool to see how each of us have our own um, niche that we work in and that they complement each other. So with that, Cindy, I'm going to say that, um, please take it away. All right. Thank you, Colette. Um, and thank you, everyone. I have had the opportunity to visit with other states and um, I kind of brag about the opportunities we have in South Dakota, <clears throat> excuse me, because so many partners do come together and not all states are like that. So we greatly appreciate um, the opportunities that NRCS and all of our partners have provided. Um, one thing that I want to kind of highlight today since uh, Kent's presentation is the grazing exchange. Um, I, I have met with Game Fish and Parks in some different states as well, but the grazing exchange is an opportunity for the landowners and livestock owners to come together. Um, the drought conditions, you know, we can work with producers that have the aftermath grazing available. So we want to provide that information out to them and just make those connections so we can keep their assets with them and to be able to keep our grasslands healthy as well. Um, the drought conditions did severely affect some areas, um, not mine personally, but in, in some of the other areas. Um, so that one we have been um, promoting pretty heavily. The staff has been working um, directly with producers throughout the state implementing, like Chris said, um, our 319 project funds. Um, the directors have been um, in the midst of trying to prepare some other grants to get some additional funding from different sources. Um, but we do want to also highlight um, an agreement we have with NRCS. We are promoting or working toward um, a mentoring um, platform um, for producers to be able to and professionals to connect with each other. And that's called the Growing Connections. And I'm um, confident it will be done here shortly and be able to have all that information out to everyone and have their partners and their um, clientele to be able to be aware of that project as well. But I wanna thank all the partners for all the continued efforts. Um, like you said, the, the last week was quite evident. We still all have some work to do and we wanna keep, keep that moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Gosh, um, this has been really great. So is is there anyone that I've missed? If so, please, um, please speak up. And if there are no takers, then I'll turn it back to Tony. So I thanks everyone. I appreciate the updates. It's really exciting. All right, thank you so much, Colette. 
And thank you so much to all of our partners that are, are helping us get our, our mission completed and, and really getting conservation in the ground across South Dakota. It really does take everybody to make this happen. And just as, as all of our partners expressed in the last half hour or so is, we all are doing a little bit. We're all doing our part to try to help keep farming happening here, keeping our natural resources in place. And just thank you all for your efforts in making this happen because not one of us can do it alone. So just thank you. Uh, at this point on the agenda, uh, I want to just open the open the, the floor up if there's any general questions or if there's any comments that anybody has. Um, this will be one of the last, this is the last agenda item before moving into scheduling our next meeting and closing out today. So just, I'm gonna open the floor. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I'm not seeing anything pop up in the chat and I'm not seeing any hands up or anybody coming off the mute at this point. So I just want to, again, big thank you to everybody for your participation today. Um, again, it takes every one of us. And as there's comments that as you, as you think about the different presentations today, uh, as you think about the different comments made from our partners and from the staff, uh, if you have if you have questions, please reach out to us. Please ask. Uh, we are listening. We do want to continue to make uh, our programs and our products uh, better for South Dakota, and we're, we're always open to comments and feedback. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any of those. Um, and with that, our next meeting that we have scheduled right now is going to be August 17th. Uh, we are going to be attempting to do a hybrid model where we will have a larger room available for, for folks in, in an area, but we are, are going to be offering this virtually also. So if you don't I'm not sure if it's going to be in, in Huron or if it's going to be in Pierre at this moment, but we will get that information out here soon. Uh, but there will be a virtual option for those who, who don't want to or can't travel for whatever reason. So thank you again for participating today. And uh, I guess we'll see you again next time. And hopefully I'll get a chance to meet several of you between here and there. So please take care, be safe, and have a great rest of your week.